Hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap. I'm glad that you're joining us today and I trust that you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes. I'm Sam Rohr and I'm going to be joined again by Pastor Isaac Crockett as we discuss a critical subject. Our title for today's program, Pursuing Success, Mission Possible. Well, how much do you want to be successful? You know, according to many published reports, including this one from the founder and editor of Visual Capitalist, quote, he said, the pursuit of success is a part of our cultural DNA. Almost everyone wants to be successful, and many see it as the basis of the American dream, end quote. But there are other reports that indicate that less than 92% of people achieve their goals for success. That means most people are living defeated, depressed to some degree, or at the very least, not living up to their expectations or achieving the level of happiness and fulfillment they desire, and I've put out there that God made us to desire. Now, if you're just watching this program for the very first time or are a part of our growing national Stand in the Gap TV audience, you'll notice that on this program, we focus on what we refer to as transcending cultural issues. These are issues that dominate our American culture with significant controversy or conflict, those kinds of large issues which seem to have no solution. So like a bad infection, they only get worse with time, and if not treated properly, they will in fact become fatal. On our daily program in the Stand in the Gap radio program, which airs live Monday through Friday from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Time, on that program, we analyze headline news from a biblical and worldview perspective and a constitutional perspective. And between Stand in the Gap TV and Stand in the Gap Radio, we cover the breadth of issues from headline news to transcending issues from God's point of view. Our goal is to identify problems, the causes, and then the solutions by going to the Word of God proving that God's Word does hold all the answers to the most complex problems facing you and I individually and our nation today. You can find previous programs by going to standinthegapmedia.org. And I encourage you to go and watch that site and watch the previous programs because we deal with key themes that you will want to know about. Please consider passing them along to your friends or consider using this material, perhaps in small group settings, or even in your church. Now to our theme for today's program, Pursuing Success, Mission Possible. Well, Isaac, uh, this is a great topic uh, to go over because, as I said uh, in the references, everybody wants to be per, uh, successful. <laughs> um, the, the, the quotes that I read about it you know, being in our DNA, those reports didn't go to why, but I can tell you why, because God build it within all of us to want to pursue, to excel, to do other things. But, uh, but when I read reports like this one, a survey from 2017, that says that less than 20% of Americans achieve their goals. Another one in 2016 says that nine, at least 20% say they failed to live the American dream. That's what it was. 92% mm. say they don't achieve their goals. And then another one from 2016 in Personal Finance uh, article there, it says that 98% never fulfill their goal. So it's pretty high. Mm -hmm. so, so let me go to you right now. You're a millennial. Uh, a lot of these statistics I gave tended to look more towards older, uh, but millennials are coming up. You're the big generation here right now. What have you found to be the attitude towards success and the pursuing of success from a millennial perspective? Interesting, and those are some scary s statistics that kind of lead us back to one of our programs we did on drugs and opioid abuse. But uh, I think a lot of millennials, you know, if you look at the job market, for example, I see where a lot of millennials, if they're offered the opportunity between more vacation days or a raise, they take the vacation days. Um, I think a lot of them are looking for life experiences. I know my wife and I, uh, right after we got married, we lived on almost nothing, lived in the basement of a friend of a friend's. We, uh, my mom had done a bunch of couponing and got tuna fish helper, which I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> and we ate it without the tuna fish at least once a day, almost every day of the week and saved up our money on our first anniversary. We bought airline tickets and went down to Buenos Aires, Argentina and you know, worked with some um, friends down there. And that was more important to us than trying to get a better car or get out of the basement apartment. 
Um, and I think a lot of millennials are kind of that way. I think they're also very community oriented. And so I think as they start to try to experience life and they still feel unfulfilled or a community is not coming together, you start seeing these large socialist protesters that are very violent because they're seeking world peace and they feel like not everybody's mm -hmm. giving into it. So they're seeing uh, the irony of this, I think. I think it's really starting to wear off on a lot of them and many of them are probably even more disappointed than uh, maybe some of the so-called more materialistic generations before them. So really, really what you're saying is that whether um, you fail to achieve financial goals, which mm -hmm. are a lot of what the boomers, my generation, did, or whether you fail to achieve your community social mm -hmm. goals, mm -hmm. millennial and younger, the end result is the same. You're not right. being fulfilled. You know, it's remarkable that that's what Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to talk about Solomon in just a minute because he said the pursuit of these things outside God was vanity. Mm -hmm and ended up going nowhere. So he was describing just like what you're talking about. Well, if you're watching us right now, we're going to come back in just a break, in just a moment. And Isaac and I are going to talk about uh, a plan for success that King David gave his son Solomon, the wisest man, Scripture says, that ever lived. He gave him a plan for success, mission possible. We'll talk about it because it still works today. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter with hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide. A website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap, and as we were just talking about, we're going to look at a blueprint, a God-given blueprint sent down from a one father to his son, David, to Solomon. And so, Sam, let's, uh, let's kind of talk about this fatherly advice. You have plenty of experience with that. You have five sons. You have a, a son-in-law. Uh, you have, what, 11 grandsons out of the many mm -hmm. grandchildren you have. You, I know that you spend special time with your, your sons, I almost said boys, but your, your sons and son-in-law uh, going, you know, fishing and stuff together just to get away and to, for you to have opportunities to pass on advice to them. Um, what are perhaps some of the things that you've passed on to them for them to find success and contentment in life? Well, you know, Isaac, um, a, a verse that I've gone to uh, in Scripture, again, Scripture gives us the direction that we need, everything we need. And when it comes to area success, God lays it out. And uh, in the book of First Chronicles in the Old Testament, chapter 28, I'm going to read just a couple of verses here. Uh, this is King David, the man after God's own heart, about to die. He's passing off the kingdom at the point of the building of the temple. And God says to him, all right, now if you establish certain things, he says in verse 8, he said, uh, do these things generally that ye may possess the good land and leave it for an inheritance to your children after you forever. Now that's success as the world thinks about it. Mm -hmm. Having something to leave, having a family, having children, and then having something left over where you can leave it to them. That's how we measure success generally. But this is the key here. And I think it's, I'm going to read this verse here because it has within it four points, Isaac, that, that really are a part of uh, being successful today and pursuing, uh, pursuing success. David says this, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. Serve him with a perfect or a complete or a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he'll cast you off forever. Now take heed, for the Lord hath chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong 
and do it. You know, and I think this is a critical thing because if folks are watching the program, fathers, grandfathers, uh, fathers-to-be perhaps, mothers, put yourself in this category as well. We're told to communicate truth to our sons and our grandsons. Now, David's communicating to his son. He says, he starts here, and this is the key thing. Solomon, my son, know God. Hmm. Know the God of thy father. And I think that's critical, Isaac, because success starts first with God. We talk about biblical worldview on here. There is God. There was a creation and act of God. That's where God, that's where David went with Solomon. Know God. Starts there, but not just any God. Hmm. They, were, they were in a land full of false gods. Mm -hmm. Know the God who created. Again, back to biblical worldview. God created. Know the God who created. Know the God who gives blessings. And then he says, know the God of thy father. Me. He, you know me, David. Hmm. Solomon, he says, you know my father, who I am. I had a walk with God. A personal walk with God. Know that God. A personal God. You couldn't have, you can't have a personal relationship with false gods, but you can have a personal relationship with the God of the Bible. And that's where David went with Solomon first. No him, no God. This is so interesting because in my family I have three brothers, so there's four boys. My dad used to use this same verse. In fact, this is the last study Bible he had before he died. And even though his hands were kind of crippled, he was still underlining. And this, this verse is underlined uh, as highly important. And so he talks about knowing the Creator God of the Bible. But can you focus on that, that the verb there, to know? Uh, it's, it's used throughout the Bible. It's a very powerful uh, word there as, as far as more than just a knowledge of God. It, 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 I, I can, and just brief because we have so much to put together here. But to know means to pursue, to discern. To, to acquire knowledge about. And, and as we were talking earlier, the, the word know in the Bible actually talks about an intimate physical relationship and mm. often used towards a husband and a wife when they mm -hmm. come together in a beautiful relationship as what God intended. Well, that's a personal, intimate relationship. That's what, da mm. that's what David is talking to Solomon about. This God you need to know and pursue, fear Him so intimately that He knows you and you know Him. Mm. So, but then he goes on, Isaac, and he says, uh, beyond that, he says, serve Him. Talk to us about what that means. Well, if we know Him, as you said, you know, this intimate knowledge of Him, just like in the New Testament, um, Jesus Christ, that union we have through Him is pictured in the husband and wife union. Um, then he is the object of our worship. He's the object of our living. In fact, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus talks about uh, humility, but he talks about that he says the Son of Man, that's Jesus Christ, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And so we're to be, we are the ones doing God's God's will, God's work. So many times we think of maybe our pastor or somebody else is doing all this, but each of us, if we are truly going to be successful, then we have a that opportunity to, to make the Lord the object of what we're, our life, our worship, and our, our goals. So, so God, again, must be the object. Serve Him. Mm -hmm. Know Him, God. Serve Him, again, the object. Mm -hmm. But there's something about serving as well a lot of people don't understand. I mean, we, everybody serves somebody, doesn't they? Yeah, and I think that's where so much of this discontent comes in because we, we're serving for the, looking for the wrong things. We're either, you know, we were created to serve God and to enjoy Him. And that's what the union that we have through Jesus Christ is that we're to go out and make disciples. We're to be growing and, and He is to be the one we're seeking first. And, and when we seek Him and uh, grow in Him, we find that contentment we're, we're missing. And until we do that, we will always be missing something. We'll, there'll, hmm. there'll be a lack, and, and you just talk to people in the workplace, and there's a lot of dissatisfaction. Well, so we, we have to know Him and serve Him, and then He says to seek Him, and, and of course we see that in the New Testament too. I mean, all of this is just, like you say, biblical worldview repeatedly. Uh, what, what is this idea to serve Him, but then to seek Him talking to us about? Well, you know, seeking, and I think God lays this in order in a, in a, in a way He does, because the seeking part of it uh, means to investigate. It means to inquire about. It really means to worship. Hmm. Now again, you said we're made to serve. We're made to worship. Starts with knowing God. He's the focus. We know about Him intimately. And when we do, we will serve Him. 
and we will seek him. And I think an interesting point here is that this word seek means to allow to be inquired of. So it mm. means to inquire of God, pursue, seek first the kingdom of God mm -hmm. and his righteousness. Seek him, but it also means to allow the one we're seeking him to investigate us. Hmm. Now that turns it around a lot. That's the intimate relationship, the giving and the taking aspect that David knew, experienced with God, and he says to Solomon, you're going to be the king, you're going to be successful. It's, this, a, this is a two-way street. You pursue God, but then you allow him to pursue you. As David knew personally, I mean, he was the man after God's own heart and wrote so many just intimate psalms. Wow, what a powerful reminder, I mean, to think of him, you know, seeing God as the shepherd and now passing that on to his son who didn't grow up in the, you know, shepherd sheep fields like he did. So as we seek him, um, we find him. And I don't know if you have any other thoughts about, about this, but you know, Isaac, again, back to the relationship <clears throat> excuse me, that we're talking about, that this kind of instruction, hmm. now we find here on the pages of Scripture, it's for everybody, but again, this is in the context of a father communicating to his son. Hmm. Now, God had said to all those in Israel, to your sons and to your grandsons. David, <clears throat> David was concerned that Solomon would be successful in leading Israel and that he would be successful in building the temple where God would come and worship. Mm -hmm. And he knew that he couldn't do it on his own. Uh, but I, I would assume Solomon, he, he was one of many sons of David. Hmm. It was a big thing to become the king and to take over from your father. Um, Solomon, you know, I think he had a reason to be proud. Um, but David said, you, you don't go the way you think. Mm -hmm. Follow the God that you've seen me follow. You know, Isaac, I think in this regard, and <clears throat> you can talk a little bit about your father, uh, because he was a real man of God, and he had a real impact on you and your three brothers. But there's nothing more powerful than seeing um, God work in the lives of our fathers and fathers demonstrating a walk of faith with God Himself. We tell our children and tell others so many times that uh, young parents, if you're watching right now, think about this. If you have children, you as a father, the first image and view that your children will ever get of the person and the character of God will be realized in your life as a father. Now think about that. That's critical. Are they getting a right view of God? Or are they getting a distorted view of God? Isaac, just share just a little bit if you can, uh, briefly right now. Your, your, your father was a great man. He was a pastor, but maybe share something that just God would bring to your mind right now to be an example he, of him passing along. He you. used to often go to these sort of passages with David in particular, and he could really relate to David because with David you see that he's, he's so human. Um, and, and my dad, you know, would often, you know, talk to us and, and repent to the Lord and come to us as family when things, you know, and he wasn't afraid to do that. He wasn't afraid to, you know, show us that he loved us and, you know, be emotional. Even though he was a man's man, he could weight lift more than any of my brothers and I. He could, you know, shoot a rifle very well. He could do all these Davy Crockett things. And yet he wasn't afraid to, you know, to hug us and to say, I love you but to talk to us about spiritual things, to bring it up, mm. to take us out you know, with him and do ministry together and to say, I, I'm praying. I'm not praying that the Lord will make you a pastor or that you'll follow up, but that you will follow God and that you will do what God wants for you. If it's a pastor, if it's something else, but that you'll seek him. And uh, he would take these and he very much took it to heart as David had done with Solomon to mm. do that with each of my brothers individually and together. And as a family, we used to have um, times of, you know, just family devotions. He used to call it family altar where he, you know, hoped to ingrain it into us. And now all of my brothers have gone in different ways similar to his, uh, whether it's preaching or teaching or missionary work. And uh, it's no accident that uh, that happened. I don't think, I think God used that 
in our lives. You know, Isaac, um, that's a great testimony. And ladies and gentlemen, you're hearing just a little bit about my personal life and Isaac and his father, but it's built off of these principles in Scripture. And, and, and when these are applied, they will work in your family, They'll work in your life. True success can be found. It's mission possible when we do it God's way. But there's one other point that David lays out to Solomon. Know him, not just know about this God, know him intimately, serve him, seek him. And then he gives him one additional command that he needs to do. And we're going to talk about that in our next segment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of WBPH Philadelphia, positively different television. To watch archives of this program, go to WBPH.org. Well, pursuing success, mission possible. We're looking here today at, Solom at, da at King David's rather, um, admonition to his son Solomon. Really, it works for all of us today. Isaac, there, were one, there was one other point. We talked about know him, know God, serve him, serve God, seek him, seek the Lord. But then there's one last one in verse 10 where David tells Solomon, and take heed... For the Lord hath chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. He had a task to do. Frankly, all of us have tasks to do, too. Mm -hmm. That's the application. But he says, be strong and do it. And in verse 20, he said, be strong and of good courage and do it. Hmm. Why is that such an important thing? And why did he conclude those three points with the final ones of do it <laughs> and get it done? Yeah. Uh, well, it, it reminds me of the Nike logo, you know, just do it. And, and sometimes we're, we know what ought to be done. We know what we should do. We know about Jesus. We know what he wants us to do. But that actual commitment, it's not easy. And that's why he says, along with do it, each time he says, be strong and do it. And a real man, real strength doesn't come from how much you can weight lift, uh, you know, bench press or how far you can kick a ball or what kind of animals you can kill. It comes from serving God, any, you know, man or woman, anybody who's a real believer, that it takes strength. And David knew that. David knew the temptations, and you can look through Solomon's life, and you can look through David's grandchildren and great-grandchildren and see that it was those who were strongest and in their strongest moments that they actually obeyed. And so to obey God, uh, we have to be courageous. Look at Joshua. You know, hmm. um, he, he had to take what Moses had passed on, and he says, come on, guys, we have to be courageous and go in. Don't care if it's giants here or you know, unfamiliar territory. And then we have to be obedient. I mean, uh, throughout the Bible, New Testament even, we see obedience in the Ten Commandments. We see it. And uh, Paul you know, talks about children obeying their parents. And so you don't just hear what I'm saying, Solomon, but you do it. Follow this through. And there's this point of follow through that I think in my generation, especially people like to pick on us for not doing, but I think every generation has had mm. some of these issues where we don't follow through. And so we take it just to a certain extent and we have to follow through. That's more important than what we say. We can talk about God and we can say all kinds of great things about him, but we have to, to actually follow through. You know, <clears throat> Isaac, one thing that you're, you're saying there shouts to me choice. Hmm. This was advice. The pathway to success is a choice. You choose whether or not you will know God. You will serve Him. You will seek Him. It takes courage to do that. But as David said to Solomon, verse 29, be strong and have good courage and do it. Don't be afraid or dismayed. For the Lord thy God, even my God, will be with you. He will not forsake you, and he will not fail you till you have finished the work. When we put into effect God's plan for success in our life, knowing him, serving him, seeking him, 
and then doing what He has called us to do. We learn from the pages of Scripture. We don't do it on our own. He will be with us. The Lord will undertake for us, and He will help us to accomplish the task He's put before us as parents, as employers perhaps, or whatever we might be doing. And when that happens, and it can happen, that is true success. I pray that you will start with the Lord, follow through, be successful.